thank you again for coming in on such a beautiful night like tonight. Um, we're so pleased to have you here. Uh, my name is Sarah Boleen. I'm the events coordinator. And on behalf of the entire staff, we're just so pleased to welcome you. And I'm so pleased to welcome Dr. Eric Finzi tonight to discuss his new book, The Face of Emotion, How Botox Affects Our Moods and Relationships. Um, in the book, Dr. Finzi collects 20 years worth of evidence collected from clinical experience and original research, suggesting that our facial expressions are not secondary to, but rather a central driving force of our emotions. Um, Dr. Finzi is a medical director and president of two dermatology practices in DC. He's authored over 20 research publications and has been on the faculty of the dermatology department at Johns Hopkins. He's been featured on many television programs and contributed to many articles. And just today was featured in, was it US News? USA Today. USA Today, a great article. I recommend you look it up. I just read it. Um, so we're so pleased to have him here to discuss this fascinating subject with us. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Finzi to Politics and Press. Well, thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all. Um, I just thought I'd give a, a little bit of background on what got me started on this, because I'm a dermatologic surgeon and a painter, and this is very different. So um, the truth is that uh, I think the book started when I was a little boy, and I'd walk into my parents' bedroom and I'd see my mother and I'd be taken aback by this very powerful and etched and furrowed brow on her face. And of course, I didn't have any psychology training, but you don't need any in order to understand a facial expression. And that's what's key. And it, it really bothered me. And my mother suffered from uh, depression, uh, postpartum depression for me, actually. Um, and um, intimately throughout her life, she would get depressed. And at the end of her life, she got very, very depressed again. And, um, you know, we, my sister and I sort of watched her slowly waste away. And none of the, the normal treatments for depression were able to save her. So um, as a physician, I felt a little guilty afterwards. Like, wasn't there something I could have done that would have worked a little bit better? Um, so I started replaying in in my mind um, what happened to her over time and uh, around this time I just happened to be or maybe not just happened I, I started working on a group of paintings of mentally ill patients from the 19th century based on these extraordinary photos of women from this hospital in Saltpetre Hospital in Paris they're really riveting photos from the 1880s it's remarkable that uh, these faces. So working on these paintings and to try to understand these expressions on their faces, I thought, well, it's probably a good idea to go back and, and read a little bit of the books on the time. So I went back and looked at Freud and, and Freud mentions Darwin. So then I read Darwin's book and he has a beautiful book, The Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals, 1872 bestseller in 1872, and then it sort of disappeared. And then I found William James, the American psychologist, 1890, and he writes, like Darwin does, that somehow that we've got it wrong in terms of the way we think about the face, that the expressions are actually part and parcel of the emotions, and in, and in many cases precede whatever your emotional feeling is. And Darwin and James spoke about this sort of emotional unconscious. They didn't use that word, but they, in other words, talked about that uh, before you even became aware of whatever feelings you had, you know what, your face and the rest of your body is already doing something uh, to get out of the way, whether it's a fearful thing. So Darwin brings up this example of when he put his face in front of the zoo in front, in front of this snake. And he said, he said, he made a pact with himself, okay, I'm going to sit there, and I'm not going to jump away no matter what. And then the snake launched at him. And no matter how hard he tried, he was already half a step away before he even realized he was afraid. So Darwin talks about how the fear is unconscious in us, and just like other emotions, unconscious, before you ever realize consciously, oh, I'm afraid, it's time to move away. And the reason for that is that this ancient pathways what saves 
saved many of our ancestors over time. It's much faster in milliseconds. By the time you figured out whether that snake is a rattlesnake or something else, it could have bitten you. Whereas if you just jump out of the way, then after the fact, you can go back and say, oh, okay, I guess I didn't need to jump. It wasn't a rattlesnake. So there's this huge unconscious uh, pathway that I discovered in these ancient, these older thinkers. Um, and I found that there's an entire literature showing that facial expressions are innate. Uh, they're conserved across cultures. Uh, you find them in babies. Blind people uh, can recognize, I can make the same expression as someone who's sighted. Our nearest primate relatives also make this similar expressions. And you find out that the face really has a very privileged role in our emotional lives. Um, to the extent that you can show things like if, if, if you just smile while you're reading a story, you will rate that story as being, well, that's a better story. And conversely, if you frown while you're rating a funny cartoon, the cartoon isn't as funny to you if you're forced to frown while you're viewing that cartoon. So that one of the key points of the book is trying to bring uh, us just thinking about the fact that what is so counterintuitive can also be true, that your expressions help create your emotions. And therefore, they play a very powerful role in our lives for our mental health as well as our physical health. Now, um, during this time, I also became aware of uh, a, a, an English neurologist, Jonathan Cole. My wife had gone to a, a, a talk by him at NIH, and, and he had a riveting talk. So I read his book about facial expressions, and he describes these amazing patients that have Mobius syndrome who were born with an inability to really move their mouths or move their eyes, sort of like the blank slate. They, no matter what you say to them, they don't react. Um, and these patients, um, when you start questioning them, they start talking to you about how they intellectualize their moods, some of them. It's rather remarkable. They say, well, I can't really feel happy or feel sad, but I think happy or think sad. So after I became of aware of these patients, I realized, well, OK, there's just too much evidence all pointing in one direction for the primacy and of our facial expressions, for them not to be playing a role in our emotional lives. So this simple experiment came to me that, well, if you're depressed, what about the, the facial expression of negative emotions, which is frowning? You see that in anger, fear, and sadness. What if I was just able to prevent frowning by putting some Botox right here, which is something I was doing all the time for other reasons, just not for depression. Uh, so I started that about 10 years ago, that small study. And surprisingly, the results were dramatically uh, impressive in terms of, wow, most of these patients really got better from just getting that one injection to prevent frowning. And it wasn't because they looked better, because some of them didn't have a frown to begin with. There was nothing to see. Uh, and I'm, I'm pleased to report that last year, a Swiss-German group of psychiatrists, very serious psychiatrists, reported that um, they found essentially the same results in a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial of Botox for chronically depressed patients. Now, these are patients who had failed everything else, so-called treatment-resistant. And they found that more than half of their patients had significant improvement from Botox. Very dramatic result. Uh, it's important to note that none of the studies I'm going to talk about were funded in any way by uh, pharmaceutical companies. So they got a small grant from a private foundation in Germany. And there's another group that is finished their study, which has essentially the same results coming out of Texas, same randomized double-blind trial that Botox helps many people with depression. And we have finished, I have finished a clinical trial with Norman Rosenthal here in uh, Washington, and our paper is currently out for review. But the same significant results in people who were depressed, some of them have been depressed for years. Um, 
Now, this always surprises people, and they say, well, oh, it's just because they look better, and, you know, it's Botox. And, and I counter to that that half of these people had nothing to see to begin with, and most of the people we treated had never had Botox before in their lives, so they weren't coming for secondary gain to look better. They were coming because they were depressed. Um, now, people worry about Botox. They think, well, you know, oh, it's a poison. And I say to everybody that, you know, all drugs are poisons. It's just a question of dose. Turns out Botox is really safe because the lethal dose is so much greater than anything you would ever give anybody. So, I mean, if you drank 20 times as much water as you normally would have with your supper, that might kill you. But if you have 20 times as much Botox, that won't. You just might get a little frozen face for uh, a couple of months. But um, <laughs> so, um, you know, and the other thing is that everybody knows Botox because it's famous for its cosmetic benefits. But at least half of its use has nothing to do with cosmetic. It's FDA approved for Parkinson's disease, for migraine headaches, for cerebral palsy. They've been able to take some children who are wheelchair bound and by putting Botox in the right muscles to get them walking. That's remarkable. Um, and so that's important to know. So what does that tell you about Botox? How can one molecule walk on all these different sides of the track? It's impossible, right? Until you realize that all this says is that all these diseases have a window, a therapeutic window through their muscles. So if the muscle is part and parcel of the disease, and you can knock out that muscle with Botox, then the disease will improve. And that's what it tells you. Um, so uh, speaking about, um, all right, so we talked about how our expressions are um, really fundamental for creating uh, everything in terms of what you feel. Just to give you a little quote from um, uh, from Darwin here. He says, the free expression by outward signs of an emotion intensifies it. On the other hand, the repression as far as possible of all outward signs softens our emotions. And William James said, smooth the brow, brighten the eye, speak in a congenial key, and your heart must be frigid indeed if it does not thaw. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think he's, he summed it up precisely, that this is, you know, that you, uh, we're not a mind f floating up there in some ether and we've got this body down here. No, we're one incredibly intertwined, interconnected human being. And so everything that happens with you inter interfaces with uh, your, your mind and your thoughts.